this Quaker teacher said, uh, one is that the unraveling of biological and ecological systems, the loss of diversity, is uh, very uh, foreboding, a very uh, grim prognosis because that we're losing the chances with each simplification, loss of biodiversity for the creation of complex life forms. So maybe we're heading toward, they would point out, uh, unraveling the bases for conscious life, complex life forms. And then, fourthly, boy, am I starting out just like the Buddha with a lot of dukkha. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but it says that with the loss of our oxygen factories, which are the trees, the great rainforest basins, and what, is, what else makes oxygen? Plankton. The phytoplankton and the plankton in the sea, uh, we are going to, uh, we're, uh, danger of creating a world where the only life forms are anaerobic life forms that don't need oxygen. All right, this is a spiritual exercise. It's one that's very hard. Even now I'm feeling it. Try going to a gathering or a dinner party or anything and bringing up these concerns. Even now, the way I was raised, my mother saying to me, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. <laughs> and here I am. I'm part of, I really want to be liked by you. <laughs> How can I be liked by you if I'm such a depressing person? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> what's your Oh, good. <laughs> All right, then I'll go on. <laughs> you see, it's, it's hard, particularly in the uh, contemporary American West, to look at the pain of the world, the suffering of our world. Because we have been conditioned to think of ourselves as uh, the captain of our souls, the master of our fate, we're bred in a hyper-individualistic society. And so uh, our thought patterns and even our psychologies and even some of our psychotherapies are reductionistic in nature where we see that uh, if we're feeling upset, anxious, angry, outraged, in grief or sorrow, it, we try to reduce it to a personal cost. We view it reductionistically in terms of our own biography or in terms of, oh, maybe you were toilet trained too early or maybe you have a problem with your father or maybe it's that time of month, you know, that it's brought down. And so we feel depressed about being depressed. <laughs> we feel sad about being sad. And uh, here is uh, where you can glimpse, ha-ha, how brilliant it was in the Four Noble Truths of the Buddha to uh, start right out with saying, it's okay, admit it. You're in suffering, you have pain. Everyone in this room, everyone in this country, I believe, is in grief for our world. They may not show it. They may not ever say it. They may be optimistic for, for the future, but they know the losses, huge losses that even if we pull through. So this is a time, the first noble truth tells me, to befriend our pain for the world. Not to reduce it in shame or secret shame to some uh, personal inadequacy but to see it, to see it as an expression of something quite remarkable. That the very anger we feel, the outrage, the very dread we feel for what is happening, just whether it's in Libya, whether it's in Afghanistan, whether it's in downtown Denver, whether it's in Fukushima, 
we dare to feel that, then we have a capacity to suffer with our world. Wow. Well, if you can suffer with your world, that means that you're not an isolated, insisted little capsule of uh, egocentricity. <laughs> to suffer with your world is the literal meaning, suffering with, of compassion. Oh, that means you're a compassionate being. Oh, that means you're a bodhisattva. That's the definition of the, in the Buddhist path. That great bodhisattva heart, that boundless heart. That's in all of us. It's don't take particular pride in it. It's just the way things are. <laughs> you, <laughs> you are an integral part of this living planet, just as a, like a cell in a living body. And that body is in trauma. And you and I, we feel it. And so instead of feeling uh, ashamed or inadequate or hiding or f afraid, we can learn to look at where it's coming from. It's coming from compassion, it's coming from caring, it's, and that caring springs, of course, from our radical interdependence. Even interdependence seems too weak a word. Our interexistence, our interbeing. We need each other and we need this planet the way we need the next breath. We are sustained second by second, moment by moment, by the larger pot body that we constitute and are part of. Though each of us is unrepeatable. Talk about diversity. Everything in you is particular to you and at the same time fully grounded in our shared life. So, uh, being able to see the dukkha, I'd like to give you a couple of examples. One is from the um, Sarvodaya movement, uh, in a Buddhist-inspired village self-help movement in Sri Lanka, uh, with which I have lived for a year and visited frequently over the years. And the book that Ann Parker mentioned, Dharma and Development, is about that movement active in <clears throat> about 15 villages. And when they go in to organize in a village, they organize to help the villagers take charge of their lives. And they use the Gandhian term Sarvodaya to, with a Buddhist angle and calling it waking up. Everybody wakes up. What do you wake up to? You wake up to your... Uh, belonging to each other, and you wake up to your jhana shakti, the people's power, what you can do together. But when they go in to a village, I've seen this again and again and participated in it, people are gathered just like this. There is the organizer, often accompanied by a monk, and the villages often take place in the Buddhist vihara to draw the people. They do not sell a program. They do not come with a solution. Or a project. They start with dukkha. So they say, well, let's see what's, uh, how our life is together. What's not working for you? And so they encourage people to be able to stand up and speak of uh, the hidden uh, problems, the ill health, the clogged irrigation canal, the poverty, the distrust. So they don't uh, bring a problem and they feel it's okay for a while. Just be with that dukkha. You have to name it if you're gonna move on to see what its cause is. Uh, there's a poem uh, that conveys 
how we de can dare to be with the dukkha of our time. This poem is by Rainer Maria Rilke, and it's the last sonnet in his uh, Sonnets to Orpheus, written in the 1920s. He's sort of talking to himself, realizing that uh, the journey here through the ages to this time has been long and rich. It's true for all of us here. And he evokes in this, in the second line, oh, the beauty of uh, mindfulness of breathing. Quiet friend who has come so far. Feel how your breathing makes more space around you. Let this darkness be a bell tower and you the bell. And as you ring, what batters you becomes your strength. I'm going to repeat those two lines. <laughs> Let this darkness be a bell tower and you the bell. And as you ring, what batters you becomes your strength. What's it? Move back and forth into the change. What's it like, this intensity of pain? The drink is bitter, turn it to wine. Turn yourself to wine. In this uncontainable night, be the mystery at the crossroads of your senses. The meaning discovered there. And if the world has ceased to hear you, say to the silent earth, I flow and to the rushing water speak, I am. See what he did just there? He did that trick with the pain where you see where it's coming from. In this uncontainable night, this darkness, he turns it to a sense shift of identity that he is inseparable from the living earth and an expression of it. You can do that. We can all do that. So we come to the second noble truth, and as the Buddha put it, dukkha is the truth about the cause of dukkha, the arising of dukkha. Suffering has a cause. It arises from conditions. We are not inevitably doomed. We are not evil. We are not uh, held down by the heavy hand of a wrathful God or an unalterable fate, we can change the karma. It's our behaviors, it's our attitudes and our ideas that bring the dukkha, that are at the root of it. You can let dukkha then stimulate you to find its cause so it can change. And in the Buddhist teachings, those causes for the arising of suffering are uh, what they call the three poisons. Craving, hatred, delusion, or greed, ill will, and ignorance all of which uh, are interdependent. The delusion that we are separate breeds greed and craving because we can never have enough. We have to get bigger and we have to own something and that can cause aversion from what we don't need and what threatens us. And each of those experiences of greed and delusion are, and, and hatred deepen the delusion. It's an exquisite case of a deviation amplifying feedback loop. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> 